Show. I'm Jennifer Anderson. With me, my co-host and family counselor, Allison Schaefer. The Parenting Show is back. Yes. So good to be with you again. Yeah, and you know, it doesn't matter how many episodes we're doing right now because we are doing several. So if you've been watching and, and you spot this episode, it's not so much right now. It's the fact that this was a show that we first started. Uh, it started on Rogers TV 12 years ago. So it's nice to now be back on the couch with you and helping parents in need. And, and they have been waiting for us. So I'm excited to be able to offer up more help to the community. Yeah, so we have been talking about all of the issues that face parents uh, and we're taking a look at it through a democratic parenting approach. Right, which means no punishment, no rewards, mm -hmm. but neither does it mean that your children walk all over you, which tends to be much more the occurrence now in, in modern families because we came from a history where our parents yelled at us or spanked us and we now know from research that you're not supposed to do that. But then we don't know what else to do instead. So right. this show answers that question. How what, can we actually guide our children towards cooperative behavior without uh, forcing compliance, obedience, and, uh, and, and and being mean in a way that we end up not feeling good about yes, ourselves? Yes. And so not only this show does that, this episode does that because we're talking about sleep. <laughs> and for a lot of people, they get walked all over when it comes to sleep oh, because it yeah. is an issue, not just with a newborn, yeah. all, all the way through. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very difficult getting uh, teen, teen sleep issues that are coming up a lot and parents talking to me mm -hmm. uh, because they don't know how to get them off that silly technology and they've got fear of missing out. So yeah. they don't want to go to bed or they're busy cramming for exams and they don't want their marks to fall. So, you know, two o'clock yeah. in the morning, you see the light coming up from under their door. So it's a, it's a life cycle issue. Yeah. And of course, our sleep. <laughs> I mean, well, I just saw that on Facebook. There was a, a something that said, uh, as a parent, will I ever not be tired again? Yeah, right. <laughs> and of course, my mom replied and went, your tired turns into worry. And I'm yeah. like, oh, that's no good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> same thing. Like, Yes. So when I appreciate, you know, when we had the um, show the first time around, we, ha we were at a different studio and we had the access to the phone calls. But so this time we've asked people to email in their questions. So, so thank you, everyone who's participated. Believe you me, your issues are the same as so many other people's. I think it's one of the greatest things about talking right. about parenting is that people feel isolated and alone and they don't know that actually there's so many people that are struggling with exactly the same issues. Right. So I appreciate us talking about so it. So maybe we can start from the very beginning because yeah. the first email that I have here is, uh, hi, Alice, and I have a three-month-old, and I'm just starting to research sleep training. Do you have any approaches you would recommend? <laughs> so we're going right back. Right back to the yeah. beginning. Yeah. yeah, so, and, you know, it's, it's good. She's starting at three months. Under three months, they're really, newborns just sleep all the time anyways. They just kind of wake up to feed and poop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they do say that, that um, a good window of time for sleep training starts between four and six months. That's kind of like the sweet spot. There's like hmm. de there's developmental um, times that are better and worse in terms of the, uh, the body's development. And actually, on my website and my resource page, one of the books is called Bed Timings, written by a Canadian, and it talks about all those things. And the other one on there is um, is a book by Wise Bluth. And what I liked about his book for sleep training is that he matches children's temperaments with sleep training hmm. te techniques. So, um, for example, some people like Ferber to ferberize your, your child, which is really, um, if the baby cries, you let them cry for a while, but then on a schedule, you might ch check in every 15 minutes. And the idea behind this then is that the child starts to understand that th this, um, this reinforcement of you showing up is, is on a schedule. Unfortunately, for, that works for some kids, but other kids are kind of like, just a minute. You were in here 15 minutes ago. I am going to cry to get you back in here again. I don't care if I have to well for 15 minutes. And they're less responsive. Right. And it turns out that kids that have a more stronger will temperament actually do better with kind of a cold turkey, mm -hmm. bright line in the line in the sand, which is actually like good night. You know, uh, I'll see you in the morning. So cold turkey, although it is an approach that works for some kids, yeah. it's terrifying to parents. Okay, so then there's our temperament, <laughs> right? There are some parents who can stomach it and some parents who can't. And yeah. so, I, you know, I just want to be really kind and compassionate that it is really super, super hard on us as much as it's hard on the kids. And if you think about it, you know, so much of what my learning and parenting is about is about being cooperative. So it's about how are we going to get along? Mm -hmm. So how, how much un discomfort are you willing to tolerate yourself in order to know that your child is, they're, they're calling for you, their preference is to be with you. They, 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 they want to be there. But some people are like, you know what, actually, I would, I'm okay with, with 
co-sharing the bed. Mm -hmm. And I have no trouble with that. I have no trouble, so long as everybody's happy with it. Mm -hmm. um, and not everybody's happy with it. No. And, and it's, it, sometimes it's not mom, you know, some, some people find it's easier to just be able to roll over in the night and nurse and get a good night's sleep themselves because they're exhausted. And if you're exhausted, you know, that's absolutely valid. Right. But it could yeah. also be the other adult that you're sharing your bed with who is like, I right. got no room, I'm not getting any sleep. I'm not getting any intimacy. Uh, you know, we got to get through this sleep training. So I, I don't want to make people feel like there's this perfect right way. And Allison says, you know, this is a little bit more of the art and science of sleep training. Right. So that was a question that I was going to ask because uh, one of the emails was my husband and I disagree on. Uh, it's asking about your thoughts on the mm. family bed. But my husband and I disagree yeah. on this and we'd like your opinion. Mm -hmm. So you kind of just said it. If, if husband and wife or partners are not agreeing, yeah. then it's not something that maybe is should be done. And, and again, I, this is the, the arguments that I've seen about sharing the bed often go into not so much in the infant stage, but more, I mean, and, and you can buy these little bassinets that kind of attach to the side of the bed for, you know, so, mm -hmm. so there, there's ways to kind of extend your bed if that makes things easier for you. But where I find that the conflict happens in the marriage is more when we're getting into older kids. We're talking about like toddlers and preschoolers. And literally if you, I mean, I, I, I wish we had like 15, you know, 15 people sharing theirs or they would just say like, yep, that's my house. Because what ends up happening is the kid won't go to bed, someone lies beside them, then they fall asleep. And so then the other person comes and they end up going to the kid bed and then halfway through the night and honestly if you had a camera on these houses it is like this merry-go-round of, of bed hopping all through mm -hmm. the night and then everybody's exhausted and this is super problematic um i think that we come from a culture that thinks that sleep is a luxury because we have this you know uh, Protestant work ethic that said, you know, everyone's always, oh, I'm so busy, and oh, I worked so hard and stayed up so late. And and, and when somebody says I'm going to take a nap or I'm going to sleep, they're thinking like, well, that's unproductive. Or, yeah. You know, you're awfully lazy. You're lucky. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we have to appreciate that it is a biological imperative that we sleep and that keeping people awake is actually a form of torture in some countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you can die from lack of sleep. And in fact, the research on children shows that even 10 minutes of missed sleep will drop the cognitive performance of a child two grades in, in, um, in terms of their performance. Really? Two grades. So that's 10 minutes of missed sleep. And if you really look at how much your kids should be getting, and I did actually, so toddlers are supposed to be getting 12 to 14 hours. So notice there's a range there because right. some of us do sleep more than others. Preschoolers should be sleeping 11 to 13 hours. Mm -hmm. and I know people are like checking this or going, oh. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Teenagers, nine to nine and a half. And on average, most are sleeping about seven, seven and a half. Wow. That's hours of missed sleep. So again, from it, it, they say that being that sleepy is like right. being intoxicated in terms of even just like driving a car or trying, trying to perform anything. It's so during sleep, I'm, I'm, I'm it's like my, my pet peeve. <laughs> so during, during sleep, what you need to know is it is like the dishwasher. It is like the rinse cycle. Right. Your body does things at night that it does no other time of the day in terms of, of turnover of cells and things like that. But, but also from a learning perspective, because I know parents are all about achievement, your, what you learn in the day stays in your short-term memory. It only gets coded and locked into long-term learning while you sleep. So hmm. if you really want to do well on a test, you teenagers who are not getting your sleep, go to bed early. That's actually, you're going to perform better if you get a full night's sleep rather than cramming and, and pulling an all-nighter. Hmm. So to share the family bed, your question. Um, so Well, no, I'm on to a million other I, questions. I, 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 I know I want everyone to be, to be happy about the arrangement, and that means everybody. So if, if mom or dad is, is not getting their full night's sleep, if they're feeling displaced, um, then, then it's, it's not okay. And we've got to ask a kid to, to, to step up and, and join the family system, and kids can't always be the center of the universe always getting things their way. Everybody has a voice, and if everybody's not in agreement, we've got to come up with another formula. So uh, once you're getting them to sleep, it's one thing, but it's that whole bedtime routine that yeah. is, I know, an issue for a lot. We have a question about, um, you know, they want to drink water. They, they want a story. They call out for mom. They're up and down, and everything is, yeah. you know, all happening within that 
hour after going to bed. Right. You just want them to get to sleep. So again, I would say I'm asking parents when you're calculating how much sleep your kids are getting. If you're tucking them in at seven and then you are spending an hour doing that, kiss my teddy bear, I gotta go to the washroom again stuff, they're not really going to bed till eight o'clock. Right. So first thing I would say is, you know, could it be that you need to adjust your bedtime? I would rather have a shorter tuck in and say, okay, bedtime is 7.30. We're going to stay up for another half an hour. I'd rather have half an hour of people playing go fish mm -hmm. or a board game than half an hour of saying, go to bed, go to bed. <laughs> I say, go to bed. You know, who needs, who yeah. needs to have family conflict? Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe you do need to rethink your, your tuck-ins and make them shorter. But really, we, I, talking about the, the, um, the child's cleverness here, you know, why is it that they're thirsty? Why, why is it they need to go to the bathroom now? Hmm, <laughs> let me scratch my head. Could it be that this is all just ways to entice you to come stay social and prolong visiting with you mm -hmm. and, and um, delay the inevitable, which is it's actually time to go to bed? So what clever child wouldn't figure out all the things that you would have a hard, I mean, say, I got to go to the bathroom. You're like, ah, oh, I'm potty training. I got to do... They'll come up with something clever. My daughter used to pick her nose until it bled. How are you going to ignore a bleeding I'm, nosebleed? She is thrilled Brilliant. that you've just said Brilliant. that. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lucy. Now and that she's older, it doesn't I can, matter. Yes, I, everything I say about my children, I have absolute permission from them. I would never talk behind their backs. Um, they laugh too. Um, but I, I just say this because what we need to do then is to not let them be successful. We need to be able to say, good night, I'll see you in the morning, and then not respond to those, please. Mm -hmm. So think about the ones that are trouble for you. I would say, this is last call for water, or put water in their bedroom in a sippy cup. This is last call for using the potty, put the potty chair in their bathroom, and, in their bedroom, and give them little wipes. Um, and again, they'll probably try it once or twice, and they'll say, I don't, you know, don't really have to go to the bathroom, or I should stop holding it, I don't want to go on my own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's um, make an arrangement, I will exactly read you one story and kiss two teddy bears, and it's the same every night. There's, there's, there's no... Um, no work around. So make the routine with your children. Don't stray from it and make sure that you've got that hard stop time, even if it means setting an alarm. So that if they are dawdling and they are going slower, then you can, the alarm goes off and you go, oh, Mr. Timer, we're not done stories yet, <laughs> but it's already eight o'clock. I have to go now. Good night. <laughs> but and then done. your kids know that you've got, yeah, you've got that hard stop and that going slower does not protract it. In, in everything that you talk about, it, it doesn't take months for this to happen. If you're, you know, like the cold turkey with an infant, the, yeah. the tuck-ins um, and the immediate stop, it doesn't take six months for it to become routine. And that's what I think people are afraid of, right? Yeah. It takes, if you are invested, you invest a week of, you know, having to hear crying. Right. Well, because I would say that one of the reasons why kids are so successful at messing up our bedtime routines is because we ourselves are tired, and when we're tired, we're just like, we'll do anything. Okay, fine, just sleep. Okay, fine. We're exhausted ourselves. So you only really, to your point, need to put aside a week or 10 days to do this. So will right. you be more tired? You know, potentially, yes, and you probably don't want to have the hissy fit that, that might ensue. But this isn't forever. This mm -hmm. is just while you're training. But while you're training, you must be consistent. So the kids who go longer than 10 days are actually the ones who kind of know something about you, which is she'll cave eventually. Mm -hmm. She always does, or he always does. And so we have to show them evidence to the contrary. I am not going to cave. Um, and so, th so that consistency is, is really, really key. So don't start this if it's, you know, you're coming up to a hard work period, um, you know, in your career, or if you've got a kid that's maybe got an earache or whatever, you're going to, you're not going to be able to be consistent. Right. Yeah. They, and to, they really do love routine. And in fact, the brain loves routine. And this is the same whether you're an adult, a teen, or an infant. The brain needs to detect that we are moving into sleep mode and it actually starts to change um, the secretions and the brain cycle starts to, to change. So the more you can set up a routine that's predictable, so it's like first we have a bath and then we get in our pajamas and then we curl up into this chair and the brain starts to anticipate. And they'll go, oh, I know this sequence. This is the thing we do before we go to bed. Mm -hmm. And it will start shutting down. So be consistent even in that workup time and, and I brought this probably doesn't need to be repeated, but let's be thorough. You really don't want to have screens for a full hour before bedtime. Right. Because the light that it emits does interfere 
with the ability to wind us down into sleep. Because again, you know, we're evolutionarily speaking, we woke up with the sun and we went to bed before we had electricity and lights and, and lanterns. Right. We went to bed when it got dark and the brain is still accustomed to that. So you want your rooms to be pitch black. I know some kids like a nightlight. You, but you want it as dark as possible. Uh, blackout curtains are wonderful. And white, a nice white noise machine will kind of drown out background sounds of people chattering downstairs or trucks going by outside their window or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are all things that we call good sleep hygiene techniques that you're just working with biology to help sleep come. Simple tips. Simple tips, but by, yeah. my goodness, they work. Um, that leads us into, because I know you mentioned teenagers and screen Says time. Says me drinking my caffeinated coffee. <laughs> wakey, wakey. Yeah. Wakey, wakey. <laughs> uh, my teenager is not getting enough sleep. I can't mm. make him go to bed at 17, uh, but yeah. I am really worried that it is not good for him. We've already talked about the number of hours, yeah. 9 to 10 hours of sleep for teens. Yeah. Um, what a, and screen time. Yeah. Limiting screen time. Mm -hmm. So... What you'll find is that if your approach is to um, try to make them, <laughs> try to force them, at 17, you're going to have a child who will just find ways around you. I mean, if they just say flat out, no, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so we, ca we can't force kids. Instead, we need to appeal to them. We want to try to influence them to make better choices for themselves. And we've, we've said this time and time again, that the strength of your relationship is going to be the thing that allows you to voice an opinion and a concern and have a greater likelihood of a child actually ingesting it and thinking, you know, she doesn't get on my back about everything. Mm -hmm. If she thinks this is important, maybe I ought to think a little bit about it. So it's about having a series of conversations and expressing your concern. And, and certainly in the case of, of sleep or whatever, you can have them mention it to their doctor. You can go on a website and just, you know, or something you read in the papers, go, oh, holy cow, you know what I just found out today? Do you know that most adolescents are sleep, whatever, and share it as, as information to them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just very wise to say, I can't make you, just own that. You know, I, you know, I can't make you sleep. Um, however, I can say I'm, I'm, I know that you have a goal of getting certain marks and I want to help you reach your goals. And maybe there's another way that we could, we could do this. Maybe there's another way that I could be of assistance to you so that you can both keep your marks up and get your studying in right. and get a good night's sleep. And how might, how might that look? Well, I can remember, uh, you know, my mom couldn't make me go to sleep but I couldn't make her stop vacuuming at <laughs> 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning <laughs> <laughs> around yeah. my bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. So the idea of then waking up or not sleeping all yeah. day is maybe not conducive to the entire household. And, you know, when I was a child, my parents, my, you know, my uh, parents were uh, Larry and parent educators as well. And the rule in our house was we, you won't have a bedtime so long as you can show me that you can get a good night's sleep, wake up um, in, with a good attitude, not get sick, and get yourself to school on time. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the first night, I like, you know, hey, I, do, I get to stay up. I get to stay up. But, of course, the next morning, I'm like, oh, wait, no. I have, ha, 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 no, I'm in a good mood. I'm, I'm going to school. Um, so it was sort of the same thing, freedoms and responsibility going hand yeah. in hand. Yeah, and that's the worst, you know, uh, the, the sleepovers, going to a friend's house, and you know that the next day there's going to be a lot of tired and grumpy kids around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. We've talked about kind of all of the all through the ages yeah. and going to sleep but maybe some of the um, we should cover some of the daylight or extenuating circumstances like sharing a room so we had a question about um, my kids share a room and when it's lights out they just start to play together um, so how and that never happened yeah, with Faith and Tyler no did it. not at all <laughs> how do I get them to stop playing and start sleeping yeah so you know I know parents don't believe this but they do play, they do have this built-in entertainment person in their room, but if you, first of all, I think there's some really great things that happen when kids share a room. I think they collude to like, you know, shh, don't let mom and dad know. They share secrets that, you know, there's some real great sibling bonding that does happen. But honestly, what typically happens is they play until a parent comes and says, stop playing, stop mm -hmm. playing. And if you really decide that you're going to, again, withdraw yourself from giving that little bit of undue attention to your kids, eventually they're like, oh, come on, go to sleep. I'm tired. I don't want to play anymore. They, they will peter out on their own. And that playtime will decrease, decrease, decrease until they start just, you know, going to bed. Um, 
you have to give it some time. But trying to get them to stop playing, most likely they know very well it will entice you to, to come to the room, just like saying, kiss my teddy bear, I have to go to the bathroom. Well, it's just another technique right. for engaging a parent. Right. Uh, another question we have is about naps. My three-year-old refuses mm. to nap, but is then so tired he's crabby for the rest of the day. How can I make him sleep? Yeah. Please, Allison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make him sleep. So, you know, I like the idea of um, switching the, the the need to sleep at nap time to the house has siesta. And regardless of whether you sleep or not, you're expected to be in your room and being independent. You can play independently, you can cry independently, but I'm going to be out here reading a book and um, I will see you in 45 minutes. You know, and again, you can set a timer uh, for them. And um, what you'll find is that when most kids are, are left in their room to play on their own, eventually they do kind of slow down <laughs> and wind down and choose to sleep instead of, instead of um, demand coming out. But, but you can't make somebody sleep. All we can do is create all the best conditions to make it likely. Um, and you just, on those nights where kids don't sleep, it's completely fine to have an earlier tuck-in time. So kids can understand two, two schedules. You can have on the days that you nap, you have this bedtime on the days that you didn't manage to nap then or, and sleep during siesta time, then this is your tuck-in time. So that hopefully then um, you're accommodating a little bit. And uh, although I know that kids who feel good do good, that if you're rested and fed, you're going to be in a better mood, having not slept does not mean that the consequences for being crabby and treating people poorly does not succumb to consequences. Right. So you can say, you know what, it looks like you're in a grumpy mood. Um, why don't you spend some time in your room and come out when you have your social face on? So it's not like a time out, but you're kind of saying, when we're out in this part of the house, we expect people to use their, their good social behaviors. And right. you're seeming to have trouble with that right now. So go collect yourself and come back out when you got a smile on your face. Yeah. And I think a lot of parents are, you know, they're listening to this going, yes, that's great to see yes to time because selfishly, that's kind of when you're an exhausted parent, that's your time to just sit. Yeah. Right? And a lot of parents still know that. Them. Yeah. You know what though? Yes, it is their time to I'm, just sit. I'm fighting on this one. No. I'm fighting no, on this I, one. See, I agree with you. I think that's what parents <laughs> need to do. What my bone to pick is, is they wait until the kids lie down so that they can do household chores. Right. This is not the time for you to catch up on the laundry. This, you know, or they'll say, they t they'll say, oh honey, I, you know, I really need some downtime. And they go do the grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. Grocery shopping in Walmart is not downtime. Downtime is going to the spa. Yeah. It, it <laughs> was, a manicure. Go take a book to, to Starbucks. It is for me. My husband thinks it takes three hours to shop. That's grocery right. shop. Yeah. <laughs> <Shh>. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Look, honey, hamburgers on special. And look at my nails look fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Bought them an hour away. <laughs> uh, but I, I think if you get into that habit, and, and, you know, it really starts when you've got an infant. It's so exhausting when you have a newborn. And they say when the baby sleeps that you should try to lie down and catch up on your sleep too. Just keep that good habit going all the way through. And when right. you go on a vacation, tell your kids, part of the vacation is that mom is going to take this time for herself. Mm -hmm. And if you would give it as an expectation, like I have this little space on the end of my dock and people know they do not touch me. <laughs> it's right. like nobody comes bothers me. Nobody asks when breakfast is. It's like I am having my time and I've trained my family to stay away so mm -hmm. I can have my, you know. Do you move to the other side of the dock Just when, when the they're allowed moves. to talk? When, yeah, yeah. when the sun moves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they know. They know yeah. when I. They know when my alone time is over. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Yeah. I want to cover one more topic sure. that I think uh, would be relevant to a lot of people who are at home watching, and that's my son has terrible nightmares Ooh. and wakes screaming in the night. How can I help him? Is there any truth? to avoiding certain foods. Now I've just opened a can of worms because that's probably more than a couple minutes with foods. Yeah. And, um, but the basics are, you know, night nightmares. Terrors, yeah. nightmares. So there's a difference between nightmares and night terrors. Night right. terrors are like brain activity and the child has, n there is no thought pattern. There is, they, they look awful for you to watch them because they do look like they're, but they, they, when they awake naturally the next morning, they have no recollection of that. So they're no, it's more upsetting for you than for them. And, and basically, like sleepwalking, mm -hmm. you don't wake them up. You just keep them safe and just sort of ride it through. And, and one of the other ways to know is um, they tend to happen earlier in the evening. Right. They're, they're cl they usually happen before you've gone to bed. Whereas nightmares, interestingly enough, 
it, tend w the way dream dreams work because the nightmare is just a bad dream. Dreams are when you have a problem presented to you in life and you are rehearsing possible solutions in, in a metaphor. So if you're being constantly chased by a bear, it mm -hmm. could be that somebody at school is picking on you and, and you feel scared and you, you don't know how to protect yourself. And so eventually, I'm using an actual example for my brother. At one point, my brother turned around and screamed at the bear and said, go away. And he never had that dream again. Um, hmm. So he came up with some kind of a solution. So dreams are very important. You tend to, to remember your dreams more when they're upsetting. Right. You know, they've got emotional content to them. Um, and they tend to go up when, when kids have like more stress or changes as they're figuring things out. Um, and so just soothing them and uh, getting them back to sleep. Um, but I used to say to my kids, and, and maybe you'll think I'm mean, but I would say, they oh, I had a bad dream. And I go, well, if you want a hug, come down the hall. And <laughs> they'd have to come down to my bedroom. Never mind. <laughs> and eventually they'd just roll over and put themselves back to sleep. And my kids actually don't have a whole lot of bad nightmares. But right. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. But you don't want kids lying that they had a bad dream. A again, because that's like the the cup of water it's like the extra you're like oh they had a bad in. dream right? you know there's a monster they're afraid of monsters you know if they're afraid i don't like that spray there's i was just going to ask you about the if spray if you use monster spray then the kids going to say well what if the spray's expired or you know that means there is a monster that we have to get rid of i want to say that's actually the creativity of your mind and if you decide to think creative thoughts that make you scared you're going to feel scared right. so you can change your thinking and think about your birthday think about something exciting coming up and lo and behold when you think happy thoughts happy emotions will follow so mm -hmm. i don't know why you're choosing to disturb yourself um stop perseverating on that thought right. force the good thoughts in and right. it's sort of it's sort of like i tell them it's like a thought bubble when you blow bubbles you just like smack it oh no i'm not thinking about that yeah uh you referenced earlier in the show about your resource page on your website. Yeah. Lots of information on your website. Yes, there is. Not all, so the resource page is, is you know, uh, books other and other books. websites. Right. But I also have a blog and a, and a whole ton of video posts. And there's a great little Google search engine that you can just sort of put in a couple of keywords from your problem. And uh, it'll pop up information for you. And jump on with comments. I, you know, I try to get on there and answer questions right. there, too. And your books are up on the screen right now. Those are information is also available on your website. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Buy all three of those. <laughs> Places to buy them are on my website. And, uh, you know, um, uh, I think that, um, well, I, I think that buying all three together is, is a perfect idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's the perfect way to I end the show. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. You can also check out uh, rogerstv.com for more information about the parenting show. Um, this uh, Obviously, this episode is about sleep. We have lots of episodes, whether it's uh, sibling rivalries, eating, um, dealing with uh, new uh, family discipline, orders. new family orders. Um, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on The Parenting Show.